It's Monday, which means you have arrived at the Hopeful Majority. Welcome, everybody. My name is Manu Meal. Today is a fascinating conversation because I've been ruminating. I've been thinking. I was like, it seems like a lot of people in our politics suffer from FOMO, the fear of missing out. I feel like our politicians suffer from FOMO. I feel like there's a there's voters. We as people, we're always wanting more, more, more. We're wanting opportunity. We're wanting power. We want... I feel like we got FOMO. And so I thought, who better to bring in to talk today to us than Patrick McGinnis, the founder of the word FOMO, HBS grad, entrepreneur, investor, somebody that's done a lot of stuff. He's even written a book on FOMO. And I'm very excited for this conversation. Remember, every week, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your content, let's get on to this episode where we talk about FOMO in our politics. All right, before we get into the conversation with Patrick, as you always know, I like to provide a little bit of my thinking on what's going on. Where am I at? Why this episode? Why this conversation? So normally, I have a take on a certain topic. Normally, I have a take on a certain idea. But in this case, I have two curiosities, two questions that are just that I've been thinking a lot about. Some may say FOMO. I'm having FOMO about answering these questions. And it's only fitting that Patrick, who's just an amazing person and somebody that's does a lot of different things with his life, very well traveled, very curious person. You'll see that in the conversation. I want him to help me tackle two things. One is that I think we live at this moment where we're always striving for something. We always want something because we feel like we're missing on an experience, we're missing an opportunity, or that we're missing out on something that could be. And I think normally in our life, I mean, it can be really good to have that drive. It can also sometimes be negative for our mental health. FOMO can lead, as Patrick talks a lot about, to anxiety, to depression, to feelings of a lack of self-worth. But I feel like there's a more sinister application of that to our politics. When I think politicians are striving for power because they feel like they're going to miss out on an opportunity, or when when campaigns are thinking about pitching us something at this moment, or when we turn our marketing, our FOMO marketing, our desire to tap into people's fears or people's optimism or hope, whatever it is, and we put that in our politics. Just as we in our daily lives strive for opportunity, I feel like a lot of people in our politics seem to be striving for power. And that just for the sake of power, just like in our personal lives and personal experiences, oftentimes we're chasing, you know, that experience just for the sake of that experience. Like, I just want to mark it off my bucket list just because in our politics, I think people are chasing oftentimes power just for the sake of power. And I think that can be very dangerous. And I'm curious about what are the implications of this fear of missing out, the psychological state on what that does? Because right now we're living in a moment, as you've seen in many of the past episodes, that people and leaders are striving to divide us just because it helps them stay in power. That our political system is built, as Andrew Yang was talking about in a previous episode, in a way where it seems like it's much easier to build a political system where we fight each other and hate each other, because that just makes things easier for our leaders. I feel like we live at that moment. And so what is driving that? Could FOMO be it? The second curiosity I hold, I'd love Patrick's thoughts on, is not just is FOMO driving our politics to an extent, that fear of missing out. But it seems like at this moment in our political environment, in our in our daily lives, that people are missing and feeling a sense of hopelessness, that there's a lack of community, that a lot of people feel alienated. You know, a lot of people are looking for friendships, for relationships, that the hopeful majority, for example, that concept was was essentially built out of this notion that I think the majority of people in our society want to live in a world where they can prosper, where their families can do better than themselves, and that we can live in a safe environment. And so the second curiosity I have is how does the impact of FOMO affect the way that we approach our daily lives? And specifically, are we as people more likely to be manipulated by fear? or be spoken to our hope? Is it easier to market on fear or is it easier to market on hope? The reason why that question matters a lot is because it has a lot of implications for our politics. Because if it was possible to be running towards positive visions, as Vivek Ramaswamy says, and others say, rather than running from things, if it was possible that we lived in a political environment where our politicians and our leaders are actually creating visions for the future as opposed to telling us who to fear, then I think our politics would be 
much less toxic, much more aspirational, and simply identify with our idealism. That how can we as leaders lead by turning people towards each other as opposed to turning people against each other? And I think that it's important to see when you think about things like FOMO, which are pure human psychological phenomena, is it easier to speak to somebody's fear or is it easier to speak to somebody's hope? Maybe it is easier to speak to somebody's fear, but is it more durable to speak to somebody's hope and aspiration and vision? We'll see. And there's only one way to find out the answer to those questions, because I think those questions and the answer to those questions can transform the way that we think about our politics and can change the political landscape for hopefully, see what I did there? The better. Let's get on to our conversation with the amazing Patrick McGinnis. Patrick McGinnis, welcome to the Hopeful Majority, sir. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you. So, Patrick, I know that uh, we were just talking, and I can only imagine what you must think of the name Hopeful Majority. You're very honest. You're very candid with your sense of humor. Please lay into the name Hopeful Majority. Okay, I actually really like it. I listen to your podcast. Everybody who's listening, I listen to Manu, and I actually, I don't want to like, it's funny. You've influenced how I do my show. I changed my intro because of you. Uh, it's crazy. He's so good at what he does. But anyway, I love the name. And my only question is like, is it a name that's been used before or is it like original to you guys? Because I actually think it's a fantastic, much better than the exhausted majority, which is what I hear a lot of. So I'm a fan. I appreciate that. No, it's it's actually, I mean, I don't want to say it's completely original, but we did a bunch of, it, primarily I did a bunch of Googling and looked it up. I'm terrible at Googling. I mean, for I, I thought about the word day one, which anybody who knows business, that's Jeff Bezos's word. And I was like, oh my God, this is such a great word. I've come up with it. And then it was all over the place. People have used moral majority in the past. That was Newt Gingrich's thing. Before that, it was the silent majority, which was Nixon's thing. As far as I know, but people can comment down below. It'll boost our engagement rate. Please let me know if somebody else uses hopeful majority. Um, if not, you should trademark that. I right should away. trademark it. I should I have a good attorney for you. <laughs> you have a good, I know you do. You, do? you always have good attorney. You have good everybody. Well, actually for, for anybody wondering, um, uh, and, and you obviously don't need any introduction, but I'm having FOMO about the rest of our conversation. There's so many topics we want to get into, but I hear that you're the person that discovered the word FOMO which when we first met, which I don't know if you remember, was two and a half, I think maybe two and three quarters of a year ago, years ago. And um, when I learned that you had coined the word FOMO at Harvard Business School, um, if I remember correctly, I was shocked that you could do such a thing. Could you please get rid of my FOMO about wanting to know about your FOMO story so that we can get on with the rest of the topics? Yes. So I was living in New York City. I, was, I didn't have FOMO because I worked all the time at JP Morgan. And I remember the last day before I ever had um, feelings that I would call FOMO. Now, granted, I was always like, I grew up in Maine too. There's no FOMO. There's nothing to do. It was uh, the day I took my GMAT. I took the GMAT. I did really well. And then that night, I celebrated with my friends and I went to bed. And when I woke up the next morning, that day was September 11th, 2001. And I looked out my window while I ran to the street. I saw what was happening. And I thought like... The world has changed. Everything I thought I knew about the world was different. And I started to think like, I have to do everything. I have to live life to the fullest. Like we could all be dead tomorrow. And it was this carpe diem thing. And right around that time, I, uh, thanks to my GMAT score from the day before, I got into Harvard Business School and I got there and it was, I come from a small town in Maine. I come from a very blue collar. What town? It's called Sanford, uh, okay. like Stanford without a T. A great place to grow up, but you know, very blue collar. And I, um, so I, you know, I, I, you know, people talk about blue collar, like you know, rich men north of Richmond, all that sort of. Like I grew up in a place that is very much that world. And um, and so I, I get up to Harvard Business School, which I, is what I call a choice rich environment. I'd never seen the kinds of opportunities, even at Georgetown where I went undergrad. It was nothing like. I mean, it was so overwhelming. I decided I had to take advantage of this singular opportunity and I tried to do everything. And I was constantly tired and hungover and stressed. And I realized that all of the opportunities, social and otherwise and businessy and whatever, it was actually kind of overwhelming. And I wasn't feeling all that happy. I was feeling anxiety. But I also realized it was such a sort of niche high-class problem that I started making fun of it 
referring to the fact that I had nine birthday parties that I went to on a Friday night, that I had what I called fear of missing out or FOMO, shortened it to FOMO, wrote an article in our school newspaper. It was the first time it was ever used anywhere. You can find it on the internet to this day, May 10th, 2004. And later on, when it made the dictionary in 2013, journalists started calling me and I was sort of like, what do you mean? that why do you know the word FOMO? And they're like, it's in the dictionary. I had missed the whole thing, which is crazy. And now, now, and, and now I, you know, I spend part of my time helping people overcome their FOMO. So I, I want to get a little bit to that nine-year gap between what happened from 2004, May 2004 to 2013, December 2013. But before that, I'm just curious. I don't think I've ever actually asked you this, Patrick. And for those of you that are wondering, um, Patrick, I, I've had the privilege of gotten, gotten to know Patrick over the last couple of years. And he's been uh, somebody that has provided a lot of input, a lot of thinking, a lot of advice. And so I have deep respect for your work. And we've had a lot of personal conversations. But I don't think I've ever asked you this, which is, did you feel like, going to nine birthday parties on a Friday was a response to living a life that I, let's say was much more simple in Maine. What did you feel like that was an intentional pursuit? Like why did you have this drive to do everything you could possibly get your hands on? Part of, I'll tell you, it's two things. The social, so the opportunity stuff, job interviews. I mean, I, I interviewed for jobs that like, I don't know why, I, th for things I didn't even like. Yeah, I just, because I was very obsessed with opportunity of, of being at a place like Harvard Business School. So that that was more about, I think, growing up with not, you know, I felt like I had opportunity, but I didn't have that kind of opportunity. But the social stuff really was because I wasn't very well liked and popular growing up. I was like made fun of and bullied. And so I felt very at home at Harvard. I kind of, you know, you're, you're in your 20s. I had grown into who I was. I felt good about myself. I had confidence. I had riz, as they say these days. And so <laughs> I, I wanted to, you know, I always wanted to be liked and I was liked. And so I was like, I want to go to all the parties because I have friends. Uh, you know, I think that happens to a lot of people. A lot of people who were dorks or made fun of elsewhere in their lives, grow into very successful people. And then they don't even know how to feel about that. And they still feel like the ugly duckling. And I think that's what I was dealing with it when I was at Harvard. I, I hope that that's, that marks my trajectory of, of feeling like an ugly duckling and somewhere on the right path. If, if that, if, if that at all works out, it'll make my mom feel a lot better. Do you, do you feel like, um, when you were obsessed with opportunity, uh, which is something that I'm thinking a lot about because at this like political moment, it seems like everybody's obsessed with opportunity. Some might call it power. Um, like, where did your obsession from for opportunity come from? Like, I want to really dig in in that because that gets to this core. I think human impulse, human nature, this world that we love in live in, where everybody's going after something, and in our politics, especially, it seems like that results in tons of conflict and division. It's such a good question. And you know what I, I, I always say, like my big, and I talk about this a lot these days, is like, it's the, the, the narcissists are the ones who are getting us into the problems we have. It's like, if you could take like those 10 really bad narcissists, and I'm not going to name them all, but you know, think about them, you folks, we all have our different viewpoints and they're not, they're, they're across the spectrum politically, but if we could get rid of them, like the world would just be way simpler and things would be much better. And I think I was a narcissist in training as a kid. Like I think I think I have escaped it. But when I was a kid, I would go. I went to a public high school in Maine. I would wear a blazer and like I was like that girl in the movie Election if you've ever seen that or read the book. I was I was a little sharp-elbowed, overly competitive. I used to call the newspaper and get the reporter to school to take photos of me for the newspaper because I wanted that for my college applications. Like I was just hardcore. And I think you um, were definitely not dripping with Riz at no. that time. You were Riz free. When I got to college, people were like, this guy's terrible. He's so extra. So I had to learn that lesson. But I think that was, I was very power hungry. I, yeah, I mean, like I could tell stories, which I won't because they're, I'm not going to tell them because there's no point, but I was definitely like a Machiavellian guy in high school. So I think I was obsessed with acquiring power as currency because I could trade it in to go to a good college and do the things I wanted to do. Gotcha. And that's interesting. So for you, it seemed like at that point, it was like, how do you get the ladder out of the society you were living in or the world that you were living in? Uh, it's so fascinating because I spent, I don't know if I told you this yet, Patrick, but I spent uh, a decent amount of time with Vivek Ramaswamy two weeks ago. A good one-on-one. -on -one Whoa, that's a topic. And I have feelings about that. Keep that's, going. That's a topic 
um, we might have it on the podcast soon. Um, wow. so that's, that's a, that's a topic definitely that we have to dive into, but I'm going to write some go, questions for you. Okay. Before, before we go there, Hey, this, this goes all ways. I mean, you said that narcissism and the drive for opportunity exists across the spectrum, right? This is not like a Republican or Democrat thing. It's a human thing. Um, I am so obsessed with the power that human nature plays in the moment we are in today, because in some ways it almost feels like the people that are trying to divide us understand human nature better than the people trying to bring us together. Um, what do you think is the role of human nature in the shit show that is our politics today? Division is more profitable. It is. It is easier to get clicks and likes and comments and engagement. I mean, this is not, I'm, I'm not breaking new ground with this commentary, right? But like, it is easier to get those things with negative content than positive content. It is easier to stand out on a debate stage by attacking somebody than by, you know, I mean, it's interesting, like Pre President Obama, he was sort of like the, you know, the you know, speaking in poetry kind of guy. Um, he, he managed to... He managed to evade that sort of thing where people just like use attacks to get ahead. I mean, I'm sure he attacked too, but like we don't think of him for that. But like if you look at a typical debate in politics, it's all attacking because that's what gets people's mind share in a world where people are utterly distracted and where they have no facts and will do no research. So you can just make it up anyway. So I think that is that's why it works. Um, and that's why people contribute to the shit show that you talk about. I think that that, that it's right there. That's the way to get to get ahead of the pack. So when I was thinking about naming the show, the hopeful majority, I think the thought process was like, I think most people out there in the world are like us. We're quiet. We want to think we are generally open-minded. We want to get along with our life. We don't have time to spend reading the news all day. We're less focused on fighting each other and more focused on working together. And yet those 10 really loud narcissists are out there. Um, why do you think the stuff that we do, you know, this notion of engagement, listening, conversation gets fundamentally less traction than the shit show, you know, the, the anger, the fear, the division. Um, do you think it's because most people secretly actually love consuming junk food content or do you think there's something deeper? You know, it's a great question. I love it. Uh, thank you for asking it. So I, I would say one, there's a couple of things happening here. Number one is our, our like human psychology is designed for the dopamine hits, mm. you know, it's addictive. So if we think about it, it's just like FOMO, right? FOMO is, is a, it's there's, when you have FOMO, there's like two sort of chemical things going on in your brain. One is dopamine. The other is epinephrine, um, fight or flight. When we are consuming this divisive stuff, it is, you know, it's, it gives us certain sort of things that we enjoy. The other thing is a lot easier, like being engaging in conversation with people that is different than you. That's risky. That yeah. requires vulnerability, you know, and it's so much harder to do that than to just being, you know, be a fighter. It's like going to the gym. It's like going to the gym versus sleeping on your pillow and it's cold in the morning and your head's on the pillow and you feel cozy and you're like, oh, this feels so nice. And going to the gym right now would make me vulnerable and make me sweat and make me work hard. And yet we got to go to the gym. So what do we do, Patrick Beginners? How do we generate FOMO around difficult, diverse conversations? Like, how do we do that? So generating FOMO, I'm going to tell you guys my FOMO formula. Give, is, give, give us the FOMO formula. We can, so I don't, okay, first of all, Manu, what I'm not going to do here is tell you that I have the answer because that would be, a waste of our time. What we can do it together is try to come up with something right now. How's that? Perfect. Let's do it. Let's do it. Co-create a solution, as they say. So what I'm going to do to frame that up, and this is something, by the way, everybody who's listening, when you want to create FOMO or you want to identify FOMO, this is kind of the, this is the heuristic that you can use, the, the, you know, the sort of the framework. FOMO is about two things. Number one, it's about aspiration. Bigger, better, more. I want more. When you have FOMO, it's because you are aspirational. You want something, right? And that that's good. That's actually a totally normal and healthy thing for human beings to, to have dreams. The problem is when it's something that is being, you know, sort of, uh, there's a lot of filters on it, like social media style, you know? And so it's like you're seeing something you think you want. You don't even really know what it is. That's where the FOMO gets nasty. The second part, you know, aspiration, uh, the second part is heard. Everybody's doing something 
and I'm not. Therefore, I must have it wrong. I'm going to be left behind. Um, and that's about emotional or psychological safety, really, right? And so what we need to do, if we're going to engineer a FOMO-based solution to getting people psyched about bridging, then we need to play to their aspirations and we need to play to their herd fear. And so um, you now have that, Manu. Uh, what would you like mm -hmm. to do with that information? Yeah, so it's interesting. The aspiration and the herd. Um, and, and again, fundamentally, the idea behind the hopeful majority is I think most people are in this bucket and yet most of us either do not feel empowered enough to be loud to displace those 10 narcissists or a lot of us are victims of the loudest voices. Like again, my take on like the moment right now, Patrick, in this, in this society is like, I don't think it's that complicated. I don't think that actually most people viscerally hate each other or that most people are so far apart. I think that the loudest voices are super far apart and then have, a, have a, as you said, a, a profit incentive to drive us into our camps. And then it's easy to play with. And I think they speak to your point to the aspirations better. So like, let's take the aspiration thing. I was on a road trip. Um, I talked about this, I think on one of the earlier episodes, I was on this road trip from Austin to Boston. Okay. And it was because my, my parents live in Boston and my uh, Austin's sort of like in the middle of the country, kind of. And so it started driving from Austin. We did like Louisiana. Then we did Mississippi. Then I did Alabama. Then I went, North Carolina, South Carolina. I know um, how America works. Like I know the map, by the way. Just so believe you know. it or not, most most people my age don't. Most people my age All don't. Right. Do you want me to drive? Say, for if you? If you, if you, yeah, if you're going to take me on, like if you're going to tell me where the states are, like I, we can skip that bit. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I will, I will have to tell you where the states are because the states actually inform it, and you know I'm a nerd for this stuff. I've got like seven books. And by the way, if you're on Spotify. You should go to the YouTube version so you can see all my books and see the state map that I'm currently actively drawing with my fingers. So um, we did this thing, and I think like most people on this trip were just, like most people are like, I want to live in a world that's safe for me. I want to live in a world and my family does better. I want to live in a world in, my, in which my kids are doing well. Um, so I don't know. People's aspirations seem pretty common across the board. So I like, agree. So, so, so I guess what would it mean to speak to those aspirations? Like that's what I'm curious about. Well, uh, let me turn that back to you. I agree with you, but also like most people's kind of likes and dislikes are quite similar as well. People like, you know, these kinds of foods, they like these types of content and yet marketers spend a lot of time and energy creating FOMO to get people to consume ketchup or whatever, you know what I mean? And so I think it's, it's, it, it's a very applicable thing. What you need is great marketing. And so the marketing is, and I don't, I'm not saying lying because like doing FOMO based marketing that is untruthful is that's clearly not okay. Um, but it is about explaining to people on the aspirational side, like what is the beauty of this? Like what, what for them? I mean, yes, of course it's good for our country, but like what personally are they going to yeah. get out of it? Is it community? Is it meaning somebody they could date? You know, there's all these like fringe benefits that one could enunciate that, that take this thing that is, you know, great and make it even sexier. And the second part is the herd part is explaining to people like this is a movement, right? It's like everybody's doing this. We're having this event. It's going to be in Orlando. It's going to be super fun. You could come hmm. if you wanted. So thinking about, and I, I mean, we, we'd have to think about how we do this, but I, I'm talking about bridge in particular, but in the bridging space, like when I, when I look at some of the, um, the way it's talked about the problem with bridging people, you know what it means? Yeah. Like, it has so like it's the, the challenge in that space like anything that's new and also in politics is you have a bunch of the same people talking to, to each other all the time about, and they use all this like language of politics that they well, bridging is incredible because it's about uniting the polity right and all that it sounds stuff. like broccoli yeah yeah make it fun um hmm. and i think like that is really like with ranked choice voting, when they they did this whole, I was involved in the New York ranked choice voting campaign, and yep. they tried to make it like your choosing your favorite type of pizza or whatever, and it was like a little hokey, but like it's better. It meets people where they are, you know, and, and most of us yeah. are not in like the New York Times op ed page, right? Like most of us are, are most of us just don't care frankly. And, and I think that like most people are just trying to move on with their daily lives. So then let me ask you this. So you say that, you know, we got to speak to people's aspirations. We have to meet people where they are. People can are, just, can I just please. please push back though? Go ahead. Because I do think what's very interesting mm -hmm. and I don't want to veer us way off, but I feel like people say that about everything. Oh, you know what? In the middle East, 
the Palestinian people and the Israelis, they just really want to live their lives. They want to go home and hug their kids every night. Well, that may be true, but like the, the situation is like, it, it's never ending. Right. And so I do think that like that, I don't know if that's enough. You know what I mean? Mm. What, what's enough? People may want to put food on the table and do all these basic things, but like that is somehow that doesn't compel them to, to find ways to get along. Do you know what I mean? And I don't want to please like nobody write in with mm-hmm. viewpoints on the Middle East. I'm not I'm just using yeah. that as an example of something where like, I always like, these are people who are just trying to like, it's, it's like a hard world. They're just trying to make their way, but clearly, clearly that either, either I'm wrong or that just isn't enough to get people to work together to find a solution. So I'm not educated enough to speak to obviously the Israel Palestine context, but if we brought it, we're not going there. <laughs> but but yeah, we're not we're not going there. We did go on it, and I think one of the previous episodes, and we want to rank those voting. We we had Andrew Yang on, I think it was a uh, two weeks ago or so. It was episode twelve, and we talked about this specifically. But in the domestic context, like there seems to be this fundamental divide between a lot of people that aren't necessarily deeply affected by an issue personally, right? So like in the Israel Palestine conflict, right, like. If I'm Palestinian, I live in, let's say, Rabat, you know, or not Rabat's Morocco, but if I live, if I live in one <laughs> of the, in the Ramallah, yes, Ramallah is the yeah. town. If I live in Ramallah, you know, or I'm living in the Gaza Strip, like yeah. my literal life is at stake, right? And so I'm not actually thinking about putting food on the table. I'm actually thinking about the freaking, you know, bombs on my fall. Or if I'm an Israeli, you know, living, or I'm Jewish, I'm living in Jerusalem, like that's my immediate fear. Now in the US, let's take a US policy issue, like, you know, you and I aren't, you know, let's say touched by the criminal justice system, but let's say somebody is, let's say they're an African American person living in the inner city in Chicago and the generational poverty, or let's say that you're a rural farmer, um, living in Iowa and you've been abandoned by our society and our country. And you feel like you've been sold out, you know, like those people have, don't have a, have a, have a literal stake, you know, in the issue. So how do you differentiate I mean, you're talking about generating herd or aspirational identity between people like you and I, let's say you and I have a specific issue that we really care about because we're personally invested, but on the rest of it, we're like, yeah, you know, I just want to live my life. I want to chill out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And you know, it's a great, it's a really interesting point too, because like in the Middle East, the FOMO part is really hard to do because it's ideology and religion and worldview that's much more ingrained right? It's you have people that like religion is a central part of their identity. And and we have that in the US. But like when it comes to being left out of the economy, like your religious beliefs don't really, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be very tied into that. So it's a very different thing. You know, I think in the US, what people do, the way that people use FOMO in this country in politics is looking backwards. Remember when things were nice? Remember when things were... The 1950s, everybody got along. There were no transgender bathrooms, all that sort of stuff. So people are using FOMO, but they're using it in that way. And so the question is, how can one do it in a forward-looking way? That's saying... Because mm-hmm. we know we can't... Like, it's, it's the most specious argument in the world, like, going backwards, because you can't... Everybody knows, like, you cannot go backwards. You can't go home. I was just in my parents' house for a week, okay? It's not like I can just, like, act like I'm five again. Like, that's, you yeah. know... And the I real question is, do we want to go back to our state of ugly duckling? Uh, that's the real question. I was really I cute. I five, but yes, no, <laughs> I mean, I want to do my thing, but it is, uh, it is very interesting that like, that's the sales pitch for the, the FOMO generator and people love it. Hmm. Um, how do you, and the problem is I would say, uh, and I don't know why this is, by the way, I've talked to members of Congress about this and I'm like, guys, why can you not? Like, why is it that you don't know how to communicate to people cool, future-looking things? You what know, do they tell you? They all complained. Yeah, I know. Isn't it terrible? And I'm like, no, well, that's your job to fix it. Let's hire a marketing firm. There you is. Know, let's, let's outsource it, obviously. Well, you know, I think that, like, that's yeah. what good politicians are able to, like, that's what Ronald Reagan did, right? Ronald yeah. Reagan, Morning in America, all that stuff. City like that, on a hill. Yeah, that worked. Or... Kennedy, like the great presidents. I mean, you made, I I don't want to like get into that either. Like what you think about these different people, folks who are listening. But like when I was a little kid, Ronald Reagan, like people like they, you know, it was like, he kind of like, he, he had a vision. right? Right. And I think that's what, what we really need is we need leaders who have a vision and the same way that like, they should be like, if I were wanting to be president, I'd be studying religious leaders and televangelists because they do that really well 
so I've been I've been thinking about this is like this conversation evolves and this is a theme that's been coming up, which is that are people more easily motivated by fear or more easily motivated by hope? Like, are they more motivated by, again, looking backward or looking forward? Because I think oftentimes looking backward on across the political spectrum is oftentimes masked in, you know, politics of fear, right? And it's like me going backwards, like Vivek says this actually a lot and credit to him for this specific phrase, which is, you know, he says that today politicians are all about running from something. At least I'm going to tell you what I'm running towards, right? Yeah. Do you think like throughout your life, throughout your work, throughout your personal experience, like discovering, for example, the word FOMO, for example, do you think people are more easily motivated by fear or by hope and love and optimism? Or do you think it depends? I think it depends. Like I think about my own self, like fear based motivation just stresses me out. I'm much better with, I'm a hopeful person. Mm. I'm an optimist. I wake up every day thinking it could be the best day of my life. I really do that most days. And so I've always been that way. Um, and I don't like fear-based motivation, although it's really good like to go to the doctor and stuff. Obviously, that's important. But I think it's easier to... Co- Here's what it is. This is... I'm, okay, I'm having a big idea right now. Get ready. Give us the big idea. I'm going to try this on for size. I think that fear-based motivation is easier to comp- comp- compartmentalize and perhaps ignore. Hope-based is not. Hope-based is a motivator. Like, I'm going to give you an example. You know, everybody knows, smokers know that they could die sm- smoking those cigarettes every day. But they put that out of their mind and they smoke anyway. And so they just are able to like compartmentalize that thing. Or, or you're in a terrible relationship or you hate your job and you're like, I don't know, you know, you kind of just like ignore it and just move forward. Dreams and hopes and aspirations are much harder to just quelch. People do it. Mm. Oh, I can't do that right now. But like, they, they're the things that lift us up. They're the, they give us like the motivation to get out of bed. It's hard to shove them away. It's hard, yeah. to, it's hard to sleep on a dream. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And so I'm not saying like a dream of like, I want to you know, play Carnegie Hall or something. Like, not, like that stuff that's totally like, you know, very hard to do. But a dream of, you know, like I want to send my kids to college or like that kind of stuff. A stable that family. Attainable. You know? I want to have good income. Yeah. Things that should be attainable, not easy, but should be attainable. I think those are much harder to compartmentalize and ignore. And I don't know why, but I feel that. Do you think that when it comes to compartmentalizing fear, that that makes... I often think about this, like if you had a Donald Trump, President Obama rematch, right? And I don't mean this from a value standpoint of one or the other. What I mean this from purely is one is... A, a, a serious appeal to dream. The other one is a serious appeal to fear, right? And that's that's obvious. Like both candidates say that. It's in their mm-hmm. slogans. Yeah. And I often think about who would have bigger appeal right now or who would have a stickier appeal. And in some ways, if you take your theory, you're saying that you can compartmentalize fear more easily and you can look past it in some ways if you're getting something better in return, like smoking, except in the context of hope and dreams, if you're being, if you feel like something's very achievable and right's there, it's much easier to go after it and much harder to give up on it. Like, do you ever think about the Obama Trump rematch? And do you think that one of them would would do better than the other? It's a great question. I, I gotta tell you, I think of okay. So Trump's very good at what he does. Like, I'll give him that. I think it's also a mediocre person can sell the fear thing reasonably easily. It takes somebody very talented to sell the dreams. So like a, the average person, you know, politician, whatever, cannot do what Obama did, but they can do a decent job of the fear stuff. Not as good as Trump because he's just, you know, his, the way he does stuff is like so insanely good. I mean, it's crazy. But his humor, but that's what I was. He's, he's on another level on, in terms of that. Oh, the way he reads people and just like the way he uses language is so fascinating. Like it's, it's amazing, you know, and this, like if you look at the news too, like you think about the way the news is structured, like Fox News, I just came from my parents' house where my father watches a little Fox. Uh-huh. And like the way that they use fear and division, it's like so amazing. It's a lot harder to be a hopeful news channel. You know, nobody does it that I can think of. Maybe PBS. Why do you think somebody like an Obama 
would be harder to replicate for the average person than somebody like a Trump? Like, is there something uniquely more difficult? Because in both cases, you're still telling somebody. In the one case, you're like, be scared of this person. In the other case, you're like, hey, here's a dream that you could fight for. Like, do you think that they're tapping into different parts of the brain? Um, the reason why I think this is so significant, by the way, is because I think mm-hmm. it sets up a fantastic conversation about the 2024 election, right? Where I think every political consultant right now will tell you to run away from something. The Democrats are going to be saying, run away from that. That's evil. That's terrible. Get people to turn out because of that. And the Republicans are going to be saying the same thing about the Democrats. So like, do you think there's fundamentally something uniquely difficult about selling hope and not even selling, but uh, helping people to aspire towards it than it is to, to fear something? Yeah, I do. And and I don't, this is, these are all very interesting questions, by the way. I think the way I would think about it is that, like, think about it this way. If you go back in time and tell people the things that exist today and act super normal and be like, this is what's going to happen, they would probably think you're a little cray-cray, right? Because it's just like so hard for people to imagine the evolved state of something like that far along the line. It's like, oh, you're doing like, uh, like if like, I remember when they were talking about doing free college and I was like, I remember being like very skeptical. Like that just sounds ridiculous. Hmm. Well, like, you know, lots of places around the world have very cheap college. And I just dismissed it. I like that. That's you're just that, you know, what are you like some sort of like, you know, dreamers and stuff like that. Now that I'm sorry I did that. And I think it's like, why don't we imagine a world where college is free? Like, what would that take? Like, let's at least think it through, right? Let's not dismiss it out of hand. But it's a lot, you know, it requires more imagination of people. On the negative side, you're tapping into people's basal fears. You're taking something that has happened that's mm-hmm. probably true. And then you're blowing it up and way out of proportion. Like, oh, you're, you know, there was a a person who came over from Mexico and they were undocumented and they were driving a car and they were, you know, they rammed it into a house and killed everybody inside. And then they robbed the person. Then they murdered him again. Like all that. And like they then, a skillful politician or a skillful skillful demagogue will like make it sound like it's going to happen to you. Oh, the right. crime in New York City is so terrible. It's coming after you. Don't go to New York. You're going to get shot. You know, that's what they do. And it's and it's, so they 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 use like existing stuff and then put a bunch of like pizzazz on it. But they, they but we all kind of have base fears around that. So I think that's what it is, maybe. I will say one thing, which is that uh San Francisco is really bad with crime, man. I mean, I I I live here oh. and there's it's it, you know Ross. For, for folks that don't know Ross, Ross is one of the co-founders of USA. We love Ross, Ross Gang. So Ross's car got smashed right in front of our building. In SF, it's hard to find somebody that doesn't know somebody whose car has been smashed into. And I don't know if you remember the Cash App CEO guy. You remember you remember yeah, him getting stabbed? Probably, of course. He got stabbed right across the block, literally right across the block. And that's horrible. Again, what's interesting is okay. That's well, that happening. was like no, that no, was but, not. Yes, that was that was premeditated. But here's where I'm going with this, right? Is crime happening right in front of us, right? Now yeah. I have no I I've not even looked at the homicide rates in San Francisco. I I would tell you, though, off of the information that I see purely anecdotally, that San Francisco is a crime-ridden place and there's serious problems, and I could easily buy into one narrative about the place. And yet I've done zero research. I think to your point, it gets at fear is very like tangible. It's in front of you. Like it's, It's hard to rile yourself up and motivate yourself to go to the gym. But on the other hand, being scared of being insecure about what people will say is so much easier to give into, right? And so, like, to me, the fundamental question becomes, is there a way to utilize generating FOMO uh, in the fight for a more hopeful future? Like, can we, from your looking into the effects of dopamine versus epinephrine, like, how do we get people to aspire for that more hopeful future where people are turning towards each other instead of turning against each other? Well, this is the beauty, is that the process of figuring that out is understanding the user. The customer, right? So it's like we could pause it. We could come up with a bunch of th- theories around what we think would work. But it's like really understanding um, the emotional needs of the person and their d- desires and dreams, and then tapping into those. That's how you do it. That's how great marketing is done, right? Great marketing isn't just about like here's a great product and it's like here are the qualities and it's fourteen ninety nine. Like right. I had this amazing um, marketing professor at Harvard Business School called Gerald Zaltman. 
And he came up with this thing called the Z Met or the Z score, something like that, Mm -hmm. where he would do like deep psychological research into people and imagery and like have them come up with images. And like he came up with this concept of, um, for like a Coke ad, putting a monk in a stadium full of soccer fans and the monk is meditating and the people are screaming around them. And it was like this, it was all based on the psychology of like what people really value. And like Coke is a moment of serenity in a crazy world, right? So one could do that exercise with bridging and democracy. Wow. And that's um, interesting. isn't it cool, right? Like, when you say Coke cool. and when you say Coke is serenity, like I'm just imagining sitting by the beach, like drinking a really cold Coca-Cola in the bottle, not, not the freaking can version, the can, I like the can, the, but you like, no, no, I, I, I like the Mexican cane sugar it's one, better. but yeah. no, no, I, I did. Okay. That's, you know what? Some divides can't be bridged and that one will not, you be know what? Bridged. We'll never fight over Coke. We'll never so fight over Coke. That's great. true. Well, you never know. I don't know. Things are getting a little, a little I crazy. I mean, I only let my, yeah, I know. I only let my sob like one a month or one a week or whatever, but well, do you, do you, have you uh, heard of Simon Sinek? I mean, yeah, I've, I've met Simon Sinek actually. Okay, I've chatted well, with him. <laughs> now, now I FOMO, now I FOMO about that conversation. So, I I came across Simon Sinek's work, like I would say, my junior year of college. And one of the examples that he brings up is why people buy iPhones much more than they buy Samsung or Androids. Yeah. And his example is that one of those products evokes a feeling of community, it evokes a feeling of brand identity that's much stronger than just this product is this much and it has this feature. Like, there's a the, the blue text. Man, the blue text versus the green text thing, right? Like it's real hard aspirational marketing at its finest. Now, a big question that I can hear somebody asking is, should you even turn those things onto our politics? Like, should those forces even be deployed? Like here in this world, in iPhone world, like the worst that happens is somebody buys an iPhone. In this world, somebody might elect a bad candidate that passes a policy that wrecks someone's life. Um, Should politics be like isolated from this hyper weird entertainment marketing culture. I mean, that ship has already sailed, by the way. No going uh, back? Not at the, the national level. And local politics is pretty free of that, I would say. Like, I mean, it's getting infiltrated, let's say. I don't know. And I'll tell you why. It's okay because marketing is based as FOMO. Politicians are in the business of setting out a vision, hopefully, like the good ones, set out a vision and then bring people along. And so if you are truthful, and FOMO is a motivator, so if you are truthful, it's okay to market your ideas to people, to package them in a way that people get excited. You know what I mean? That's really beautiful. And that's what great politicians should do. So I don't see a problem at all. What I do see a problem with is if you use it you know, if you like, you, you're like, it's steeped in misinformation or something. And like, then, you know, then that it can, it can be used for both good and evil. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that. Have you been uh, following Vivek Ramaswamy's candidacy at all? Well, so I have been, um, I have a, I have a lot of feelings about Vivek. So yes, let's hear it. Have, let's, hear it. Uh, let's hear it. Let's hear the feelings unfiltered. Yeah. So, um, and by the way, I hate, I never go on the record on politics. And so this is like, you're not going on the record. The, the, I promise you the last place that the people search for, for the record is a conversation with me. Okay, good. But These I never two- talk about my political views in um, public. I'm going to do that today. Um, I mean, I do a little, but like I get scared. You don't even have to talk about, you don't even have to talk about politics. I'm just curious what you think of his. Campaign. No, I'm going to tell you what I think. Why, you know, yeah, this is why we're here. Um, and I can do that without being insulting or whatever, you know what I mean? Obviously. So my view on Vivek is number one, he's a very intelligent person. He's clearly been a high achiever and that it's wonderful that he has done so. And like, so respect there. I think that unfortunately, um, he has no core. He is, he will, you know, it's always, and this is like the thing that kind of blows my mind when people have made a lot of money will still just like, do anything for, you know, they'll do anything to get ahead. Like, it's like, Vivek, you, you're a successful guy. Like, you don't need to change your position six times. You don't need to be obnoxious, like blah, blah, blah. But he is, and I think it's partially because that's what got him to where he was. Probably he did the same thing in the business world, um, I, I, which is kind of interesting um, and surprising. And like entrepreneurs have to be, you have to kind of be willing to like say and do anything to succeed as an entrepreneur. It's part of the personality archetype. A lot of times. Um, so there's that. I, where I get frustrated with him and where I get bummed out, it's, it's sad to me. Because I was actually, after the first, I didn't watch the debate that was held um, last week. 
Oh, good but, for you because I have to live tweet it. No, I mean, I was at a dinner and with- No, good for you. <laughs> but I listened to this, I was driving home and I was listening to this Boston radio station. People are calling in and sharing. People loved him. Like people, a lot of people are like, well, I like DeSantis, but you know, I really like Vivek and he should be, or I like Trump and Vivek should be the VP. And it made me sad because I'm like, this is a guy who is talented. And he is using his talents in a way that I find unfortunate because he is obnoxious to people. Um, he is um, selling snake oil. Like a lot of the things he's saying just are kind of like about like the, like climate change is, 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 is not, you know, is not real or it's a hoax. Like that stuff, it's like, dude, like, come on, dude. Like, why are you doing that? And so it bums me out when somebody who is talented and could do really good things in this world is also kind of a sophist. And what I mean by that is like, just like, you know, they're like, he's like a wannabe demagogue, like all this stuff around the woke ink and all that sort of stuff. Like there is some value to what he's saying in terms of the way companies, but like to turn that into like a product and then try to like, you know, grift off of it, in my opinion, it's just negative. You put negative stuff out there in the world. So if he could do the good things that he's good at, point it in the right direction, point the hose towards the fire and not towards the crowd, <laughs> I think he'd be in a great place. But unfortunately, in today's Republican Party, I don't know if that a guy with those kinds of ideas could get elected. So that's why he's doing this thing where he's like, I'm going to pardon Trump. I wanted to be my advisor. Like, do you really? Like, you really want to hang out with that guy all the time? Like, what is wrong with you, sir? So I'm curious about one thing, which is that you're saying he doesn't have a core, right? Mm -hmm. uh, transparently, I was just on a call. I, I was I was on a fundraising call for Bridge, and it was with a, uh, a private equity person. And essentially they called me on, they said like, you're not authentic. And they basically just said that straight up to my face. Now, if that there's like- not true. So there, I said it. Well, I'm talking about it publicly. And so hopefully it's, it, hopefully it's not the case. But either way, like the reason why that comment really bothered me was because like this guy doesn't know anything about me. He probably sees like, there's so many different people he comes across on a daily basis. He sees this like person that can talk, I guess, okay. And uh, like 30 minutes and you have a conversation. And- um, and like we had a direct conversation, but I guess he just did not appreciate sort of the, the authenticity piece of it. And to appease, it actually felt like he was saying, like, I don't have a core, right? Like he was, it, I was, and, and I agree, like entrepreneurs to an extent are constantly moving around. You got to say stuff to get stuff done. You're moving, you're underestimated until you are estimated. How do you gauge that of a public figure that you might not know anything about, and I'm not challenging this. I'm just, this is one of the fears that I have for public office or like just doing anything publicly is I, one of my deepest things is I work so hard to be myself because it is a very yeah. incredibly difficult sometimes. And then knowing that there's that there. So like, how do I avoid lacking a core or also more importantly, how do you tell when somebody actually doesn't have a core? What do you think he's doing? Yeah. Like you see that so feeling. So what gives me that it's, it's interesting because I also am using, I have a lens of bias and I think the reason why is like, I look at a guy like that and I've known people in the past that he reminds me of. And I'm like, I knew that guy in college. Like, I'm like, I know exactly what he was like in college. And like, I had this very interesting, uh, this will tell you how to figure it out. I had an interesting experience. Do you know who Eric Greitens is? Eric Greitens was the governor of Missouri and he had to step down because of the, uh, like, Oh, I think I heard crazy, about this. He like yeah. tied a woman up and took her picture. Like, yeah, it was very odd. odd. But he was, he was like, like, he was like a star, right? Navy SEAL. Yeah. Or went to Duke, went to, was a Rhodes Scholar. Um, and so I was introduced to him by somebody when he was running for governor. And I had a call with him and I was really impressed. I was like, whoa, dude, this guy is the best. And he also kind of buttered me up. He's like, oh, if you get, if I get elected, we're going to teach your book in every school in Missouri. I was like, really, dude? Like, okay. Like, yay. But I actually said, I wrote him a little check because I was like, this is the kind of person we need in politics. Principal. He's a Republican. Great. You know, like I, I used to be a Republican at that time. And uh, okay. Then I go to this barbecue like a week later with like all these Duke people. And I'm like, oh, you guys went to Duke. I just met this guy, Eric Greitens. Like, he's probably like, you're right around your time. And people are like, that guy is a total insane sociopathic narcissist. And I'm like, what? He's so great. He's amazing. Like, what's wrong with you? And they're like, when he was in college, he did all these. And he, they, they basically were like, he is not what he seems to be. He is like a stay away. And I was like, nah. Well, you just Google him, everybody. He's not a nice man. And I think that this thing to know if somebody like what people should do 
the journalists who are listening, just go find Vivek's classmates and ask what he was like. And is like, is this real or not? Because um, I can guarantee that if you go to, like, if you go, like, Donald Trump, like, like him or dislike him, if you go ask people who work with him what he's like, like, they'll be like, he's exactly like what he is. Right, right. So, like, that's I'm interesting. Okay, like, that's that, yeah. So that's how I think and about you ju- it. You judge you judge authenticity by the people that have known you the longest, or the people that associate with you. And I guess a part of me is also like, well, what if those people have like a certain agenda to like go against you? But I think there's other ways to go against you instead of just saying like this guy's a total narcissist. And so yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay, so let's let's then one other thread I want to draw out with regards to Vivek. So you know he's obviously very talented. Um, when I had a conversation with them and they should definitely come on the pod because I think that's a way for us to have an even deeper conversation about some of these things. Like I think, I think the people, American people are craving authentic, real people. I think that's one of the selling points of president Trump. Um, it's honestly why a lot of people are over president Biden in some ways, because they just don't know what he's up to. Um, like honestly, he's and candidly, never, yeah, kind of nice. What's, not what's your take? About <laughs> I'm like loving this break from knowing about what our president does. Like the four years of Trump was like every, it's like, Trump just had McDonald's for lunch. Oh my God. With Biden, I'm like, I don't even know. I guess he went to a spin class or something last week. Like, yeah, I don't know. Is, is he even in charge? Oh, I, I I mean, listen, it's really, I would hate to speculate on any of this stuff. What I would say there is I've had this conversation with a lot of very well-placed people in politics and with just friends. Well, I'm like, you know, Joe Biden has really done, and I think he's done a lot of things. He has accomplished a lot of things. Like, just look at the red ledger. Like, it's like, you may not like it, but like, he's done a lot of things. And it would be wonderful if he were able to then transition to somebody who could, you know, he could leave a legacy right now and then to a new generation of talent. And that could be whoever you want. We could have, you know, an election, right? And people say, no can't do that because Joe Biden is the only one that can beat Trump and blah, 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 blah. And maybe that's, I don't know. But the thing is every election now feel it's positioned as like a make or break it for America. It's like, oh, the school board election in Elk, Elkhurst, Indiana, like this is it. Like if this one doesn't go the right way, America's done. And like, I just think <laughs> that at some point, like we can't live like that. Yeah. Or we just, or we just beat ourselves into submission. Like Andrew had this fascinating take. Andrew Yang on the last pod was like, I don't even know. Maybe it was a pod before that, but he was like, his take is that we we're, we're not going to that will slump into authoritarianism. And I think part of the way that you slump into authoritarianism is by just giving up. You're like, dude, if every election is that pivotal. Um, you're just you're just exhausted, right? And and that's like the entire reason why it's the hopeful majority, not the exhausted one, is because at least hopeful evokes something optimistic. Um, but it's interesting, you know, you've got Trump, you've got Biden, you've got people like Vivek, you've got DeSantis. There's rumblings of Gavin Newsom. Um, what is your advice? Oh, I, I, okay, you want to talk about Gavin Newsom? We'll go there. But what is your advice no. right now? You, you don't want to talk about old Gavin? I, I think he's really good at getting the camera on him. He's good looking. I mean, he's got great hair, but like in the same way Vivek is great at getting coverage, Gavin's great at that. Maybe he'd be a great president. I don't know. I haven't researched him that much and I don't live in California. But like, I think there are many other wonderful people that should be in the mix, you know, alongside him or before him. Okay. So what is your advice then right now to somebody that's waiting on the sidelines? There might get a little bit of FOMO. They're like, oh, I should jump into this race. I should get in. I should get in. And they're let's say they're on the democratic side because the Republican side is pretty saturated, right? How do you advise somebody in our politics to balance FOMO with a genuine Mm. desire to actually serve? And and we've had, we had historian Jeremy Suri on, I think it was episode three or something where Mm. he, he wrote a biography in Kissinger. He spent, I think over 36 hours or something. Don't quote me in the exact hours with Kissinger who was like the ultimate realist power guy. Yeah. And I asked him this question, like how do you balance the ambition for power with a genuine desire to serve? So in this case, like how do you advise somebody that's sitting on the sidelines with a desire for FOMO and a genuine desire to serve? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, listen, the thing about running especially in this environment, like say you say a Democrat, is that it is you are going to be immediately pummeled by everybody because the system, our system 
is anti-competitive. Like more competition in our democracy is something people don't want. Unlike every other market in the entire world. That's interesting. Our democracy is anti-competitive. I hadn't heard that phrase. Sorry, keep going. I'm, it's not my, by the way, I will give full credit to Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. We have a system that is designed to perpetuate, and this is like a lot of stuff Andrew talks about too. So Andrew Yang, um, uh, you know, he's done a really good job thinking this through and the ranked choice voting and other things. It's designed to favor the two parties and it's designed to limit competition. So like, that's why the no labels thing is such a bad idea if they were to come in and run a third party because our system doesn't allow for that the way it is today. Like it's going to take away from, you know, most likely Biden and then, you know, Trump walks to the election. Like if it were ranked choice voting, like we could have 30 candidates and that would be wonderful. They, the, if there were ranked choice voting, Trump would have no shot of becoming the nominee. But unfortunately, the more competitors you have in an election without ranked choice voting, the easier it is for, for the, you know, people to split the vote of the kind of the hopeful majority and then somebody squeaks through. Mm. And so that I think is the the question one has to ask oneself if one is thinking about being of service is like, am I doing harm in my desire to be helpful? And I also think that incumbent politicians that are, you know, like we see this with some of the folks in the Senate that are all like way beyond what they should have retired is ask like, am I doing harm by staying? You know, if you're a Supreme Court justice and you're hanging on, are you doing harm? Mm. That's so difficult in some ways because I imagine if I'm like an ambitious politician, let's say relatively young, and like I actually believe that I would be better for the country, like I genuinely believe that, then in some ways I would rationalize that sitting on the sidelines might create more harm because the way I got here thus far has been by disproving expectations and by disproving what is possible, right? And so it's like, it's like, but I can punch through, Patrick. Like, I can punch through. Like, me actually sitting here, like, you're saying, oh, you'll do harm because maybe you might derail, you know, the current person that could maybe unseat the person you don't like. Is like, but but I can break through, you know? And it's it's just this, like, I sometimes I have such a hard time applying a degree of, of critique on anybody in public service in some ways because I'm like, would I be good enough to make the decision that I'm asking somebody else to make? Oh, for sure. And to be a politician and to believe you can win an election, you have to sort of be irrational in a sense, right? You have to have the same gene as the entrepreneur, which is like, I'm willing to take me like face failure and, you know, and humiliation and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, and I think you see this with folks who've run for a bunch of stuff and never won. You, you know, you can't just, if you don't win at some point, your career is over. You know what I mean? If you lose badly, like the, like a lot of people run because they want to be relevant. Maybe they want to get that like Fox News or that CNN contract or whatever, make some money. Like running for president is a great way to boost your sort of your your PR on somebody else's dollar. Um, but look at like Francis Suarez in Miami. Like he didn't make the debate stage. He didn't raise any money. Like he comes off looking very diminished. Right. So it is... Um, it's really like there have been, you know, Dean Phillips, Representative Dean Phillips of Minnesota. There were some rumblings he might run for the Democratic position. He decided not to. He took a principled view on it. Like, I think it's interesting to look at what Dean has done. He's, I, I really admire him. I think he's a really disciplined public servant. You know, his decision making process is, is, is one that, like, you know, I think one could learn from. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know him enough to ask further questions on that. But I, the one time I think I've had a conversation with him is interesting. And there's people like this across the board. Frankly, I, I did get credit to Vivek. Like, I mean, maybe I might be eating crow in a couple of years, but mm. he really was the exact same way in public as he was in person. Like, I was actually shocked. In some ways, mm. I felt more turned off by it because he was speaking to me as if he was speaking to a crowd of 100 people. I was like, dude. You know, but it's interesting that you're saying that you got to take principled stances sometimes and principle sometimes can can be more important in some cases than ambition. I Listen, I hope that Vivek, I hope I'm wrong. Like, because I think that- I, my, I hope that we want our president to do well. Oh yeah, yeah. like we, we do. And like, it may, it could be like, if he were the nominee, by the way, I think he would, you put him on stage with somebody who's way older than him. Like he's going to be, he will have, that will really play to his strengths if there's a debate. I think it'll be like devastating. Oh, it would be like 
crazy, crazy, insane. And also because he'll just say whatever he wants. Like, I don't think he's super principled. Maybe I'm wrong. But like, I do admire the talent. Like, I, you know, I may not agree with what he has to say, but like, he has clearly, he's managed to break through and come off and he's smart. And like smart people get a, he gets up on that debate stage again. I didn't watch it, but like, it's clear the guy has brains. And like, so what I would ask of you, Vivek, if you're listening, or when you come on the hopeful majority of Vivek and you have the combo with Manu, is like, you have an opportunity here to do something really special. Like, how will you use that power? Where will you direct the water towards the crowd or towards the fire? You know, think about it. And then, you know, if you're doing the right thing, then we can all be in your cabinet and it'd be really nice. And I think that's, those are questions we should be asking of, any candidate, any nominee across the board is, is like, what drives you? Why do you want to do what you want to do? And I think fundamentally the way that you build a world of nuance, which is what we're trying to do with the hopeful majority is you have to speak to people's aspirations, desires in that hopeful, optimistic way. We could go on forever. And yet there's one question that I have to ask you that I ask everybody from celebrities to politicians, to people in my daily life, to to like myself on a daily basis, you know, especially when um, I run into a buzzsaw like the call I had earlier today, is the question why? You know, like, why do you do what you do? Whether, it, and it could be anything, you know, it could be your family, wh- wherever you want to take this. But why do you do what you do? What's your purpose? Yeah. I've always been a curious person. I love learning, I love new things. I love, really, really love being able to, so I've traveled, as you know, Manu, and for folks that are listening, I've been to 114 countries as of today. Maybe we'll get to 115 by the end of the year if we're lucky. Well, at the current um, rate, it seems like you might get to like 120, however many days are left. Jeez, I don't want to do that, but you never know. So anyway, I go to these places and when I look around, I see the commonalities and everything. Like, I'm like, oh, I just ate some cheese. This reminds me of the cheese I ate in the Republic of Georgia a month ago. Whatever. You know what I mean? I'm really good at that for some reason. It's like a skill that I have. And I love the connectivity of it all. And that comes down to people and opportunities. And, and, and so I've always loved that. I've always been fed by curiosity. And so that's driven me into the work that I do, into the people I spend time with, into the political stuff. Like, I, I'll f- bring this to, to the politics part because I think that's like the, the question like that that's really hyper relevant for our conversation. Like, why am I involved? So I'm involved in, you know, a bunch of political stuff. And I've always loved politics. I like the punditry. I like the game of politics. I always thought it was kind of fun. Like, I don't like baseball. I like politics. After 2016, um, and I'd always been, you know, my work had been international. I had seen countries that political situation deteriorated and how it it really like blew up the country, Turkey, Argentina, places like that. And I started to see some of the same tendencies in the American political situation. And so I started, I kind of was like, wow, I, I need to take, I've been running around the world doing my thing. I really need to turn around and come home and take some of the stuff that I've learned and try to apply it here Mm. before it happens. Um, because it is a playbook. I mean, I, I, it's like, it's like crazy how much I used to like make fun of my Turkish and Argentine, not make fun of, but I'd be like, you guys are so dramatic. All your political, like, oh my God, you guys like enough. And now I look at America and I'm like, wow, we're kind of like, I feel like I'm an Argentine right now, you know, without the, without like, we don't have as much stake, but you know, politically it's very, there are some really close things. So that's kind of bringing it back, you know, I've been able to be curious and learn a ton of things. And I've seen a lot of things around the world and I've been able to assimilate them in my head. And I'm bringing that back here into our political situation. It's like, how do we take those lessons to make a difference? And that's why, you know, I got involved in Bridge because I do think that like, when you look at the country like Argentina or Turkey, people just can't talk to each other. They have so much division. And so therefore, political leaders can do whatever they really want to do. Because there's not enough people to like get together and unite and say this isn't okay. Do you know at the peak of the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of our mutual uh, people that we both admire, David Gergen, told me the story. In the peak of the mu- Cuban miss- Missile Crisis, every single general uh, around our uh, JFK was telling him to to essentially nuke the Soviet Union or to attack Russia, and he went through that crisis. Obviously, nothing happened at the end of it. 
the, somebody asked him, what do you think is the most important characteristic in a human? Take your pick. And uh, JFK said, well, why don't you guess? And he went through a couple. He finally said courage. And he said, yeah, courage is important. But ultimately, I was surrounded by eight people, all of whom were telling me to go to war with the Soviet Union for whatever intention. But I was fundamentally curious. And I think his big thing was curiosity. And what I've so deeply appreciated about like our friendship and our relationship is you're almost like always pushing each other to be more curious. It's like a curiosity Olympic and it's like, who's going to out curious the other one, right? Like who's going to come up with the fun fact of the day to stump the other person so they can come up with a better fun fact. And I just, I deeply appreciate that. And, um, thanks for being on. Where can people, uh, 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 find more of, of the FOMO, world the podcast the conversations give us give people some fomo about fomo yeah for sure so i have this podcast called fomo sapiens andrew yang has been a guest a couple times actually so we have that in common too and manu has been on the show um and it's a show about how entrepreneurial thinkers take their own path to success in business and in life and so um and for you guys that are listening i'm trying to think like you know some of the people, but especially like I did have Josh Peck on, who is you know he's like really you Josh Peck, yeah. So you guys would know he's great. Dude, or like you, I would want to want to want to have. I love Josh. He's a really nice guy. He's 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 great. Um, we have a warm Instagram friendship, and then uh, Drake I and Josh Jason. for anybody wondering. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, well, Drake has been naughty, so you know we don't talk about him. But so FOMO sapiens, two words. You can find out more about my work uh, at patrickmcginnis.com. You can find me on Instagram, Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis. I promise it's it's a pretty good Instagram. Um, if you like international travel. And uh, you can find me on X at PJ McGinnis, <laughs> Blue Sky at Patrick J. McGinnis, and um, the other one, the Reds at Patrick J. McGinnis. The Reds? That's a real thing. Red thread? Threads? Thread. Oh, threads. Oh, threads. I mean, who's God, using what's going threads on with right words? now? The Reds. Nobody. X oh, using these man. things. Nobody. Hey, we're there's gonna. Too many. You're gonna have to grace us with your time um, again because there's so many things that I want to ask you about Twitter itself. Um, there's so sorry X. There's so many things we haven't gotten to. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for such a fascinating, meandering conversation. We touched on Joe Biden. We touched on 2024. We touched on Vivek Ramaswamy's candidacy. We touched on Obama legacy AI. We touched on a bunch of things. And let's just say that what's interesting about this conversation is that it's an interesting framework for how to think about the world. And what I'm particularly focused on right now is how do we generate FOMO for things like the hopeful majority? How do we empower people like us to be more vocal about building a world of nuance instead of building a world of outrage? Patrick, thank you so much for your time. Remember, every Monday, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, if you're on YouTube, leave a like. If you're on Spotify, Apple, leave a review. All of it helps as we're building this hopeful majority together. We've got a country, a democracy, and a movement to empower. See you next week.